prevailing mindset of, of the period. But the Buddha does say that he will use the word self. What's it? The word self. He says, I use it, this word as a worldly convention, as well as the words I and mine and self. He says the enlightened one can use these words as worldly conventions in order to conform to the language of the world, the thought, the thought forms of the world, but he uses them without misapprehending them. And so on this basis, I would say, from a Buddhist standpoint, that we can speak about what I would call the conditioned self, the person as the conditioned self. If one wants to use the word in that sense, no harm to use the word self to refer to what we would call the empirical person. As long as we don't invest that word self with the notions of some kind of permanent base of individual identity or understand the word to imply that we have this mastery over the elements of our being. Is it, it's my understanding of this is that it's closely tied to his objections to the caste system because the idea of the permanent self was a verminical idea and the Brahmins and Kshatriya and Vaishya, second to, to a lesser extent, were involved in a massive effort at that time to dominate the rest of society. And part of their need to do this, yeah. what, and, and the, the mythology that they were using to do this, was the idea that they were permanent spiritual creatures. That's what was supposed to justify the Brahmins' superiority to everybody else in the Gangetic plane. And so when when the when the Buddha is saying, well, if that is that when he's saying, well, there isn't a permanent self, he is tacitly denying the superiority claims of the Brahmins. Right? And so it's a so there's a social movement in there. And I think that claim, you see, that's the claim that's basically at the bottom of the caste system. And People who dominate society everywhere always want to create a caste system because it's what guarantees that their children will have the same privileges that they have. Right? So it's an implicitly anti-authoritarian view, the impermanence of the self, because it deprives the supposedly superior people of their motive for permanent superiority and also for the superiority of their children. <laughs> it seems to me that there is some connection between the Buddhist doctrine of anatta, the way the Buddha goes against, at the theoretical level, the Brahminic doctrine of the self, the Ashman, yeah. and the Buddhist critique of this rigid class system. Yeah. At that time, it wasn't yet what we call the caste system, but it was moving in that direction with these solidified social classes. <laughs> But even the Brahminic, or at least the later Brahminic view, accepts the idea of rebirth. And on those premises, one who is now a Brahmin could fall away from his Brahminhood and be reborn as a Kshatriya, a Vaishya, even a Shudra, or even an outcast. And one who's now an outcast, if he gets enough merits, he can be reborn into the higher classes, even as a Brahmin. So even with the permanent self, as long as you have the doctrine of rebirth and karma, one isn't assured of a permanent, <laughs> a permanent position at the top of the caste system, because one can fall from that. But there does seem to be some kind of connection. But it's, it's a, a topic that would require further investigation. I can't speak with full authority about. It. You have a question. I have a question. She just. Okay. Okay, we'll take one question here. It was just trying to, just trying to confirm something. Um, let's see if I can gather my thoughts. Uh, what's spoken of is what is being reborn, which I know a lot of people think of as a self. To 
to me, tell me if I'm wrong, that whole notion, the whole problem of it is the grasping onto that idea. Yeah, it's, and I think that it helps me, but tell me if this is right thinking. Yeah. You can get fooled when you use consciousness because it seems like a self. Because yeah. that's how perception works, it's just the nature of the beast. So I tend to think of it as what gets reborn is their tendencies, tendencies that one has through yeah. grasping. Yeah. It's the holding onto it that's, yeah. and it's very ephemeral, and there's no, there's no deep point, there's no real core, although it seems like a core. That's just sort of what's been occurring to me lately, I wanted to know if I was on the right. Yeah, actually that's expressed very well. It all seems it's, grasping, it's, yeah. it's, and yeah. sometimes when you meditate, it's, sometimes I'll get a glimpse of, oh, it's like holding on like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have a tendency to not want to be. That's just my thing. <laughs> but then it's there's a frightenedness because it's like oh yeah. no, because it's, it's really gripping on tight. Yeah. It's the best way I can do it. Oh, and just if this helps anybody, this might be interesting. My father was a physicist. Years ago, he told me everything is an aggregate mm. because this well, plastic. Yeah. It's not solid. It's just the nature of perception. Our perceptions yeah. are limited, yeah. so everything is atoms. And then there's the subatomic level. It's just an interesting thing to be told as like a 10-year-old kid. Yeah. But if that helps anybody, everything's an aggregate. Yeah. Everything. Because this goes through the universe too, not just for us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll shut up. Right? Everything except the clocks, they say. <laughs> <laughs> the clocks. Yes. But ten years from now they're going to find the clocks are made up yeah, of sub sub, sub, sub clocks. <laughs> okay, we'll take one question and then I'll try to go on to this is actually almost difficult for me to say because as I've been studying Buddhism and uh, practicing for 10 years, this has been like, that's why this is a very interesting discussion. Yeah. This is like the core of some things that a lot of teachers have struggled to answer and then if, yeah. God forbid, the word soul comes up, then it's big trouble because, you know, that's another debate that, you know, of course no soul, okay. Um, there's two things and it's, they're the same, you know, non-self. Yep. There's a discussion of oneself, and then there's a discussion of what happens when we die. Yeah. And it's a big thing. And, um, you know, I've studied a lot of other things, and there are people who have these past life regressions, and they have, yep. you know, visions of past lives, and that's clinging, you know, onto our past, you know, ourselves, because it's viewed at what we were in a past life. And I'm confused by the whole thing, and the Buddha, you know, one of the moments of enlightenment, I don't know if I'm uh, taught well. Yeah. You know, have these all these visions yeah. of all his past lives. Yeah. So we don't want to cling on to the past lives, but you know, yeah. what is you know, there is one answer. The Buddha understood one answer of what is brought forward to from each rebirth. We don't want to cling on to Wait, put the microphone closer to the mouth. Yes. Okay. So that's the question. I don't what, get the just what, before I told you. Well, what did the Buddha you know, all these rebirths? Yeah. I don't even know what I'm saying because I'm so confused about it all. Okay. okay. But the fact that there is something that was visioned by the Buddha as this rebirth, and that was yeah. part of what he was. Okay. And then you have a Bodhisattva yeah. who is uh, maybe you know reincarnation of you know yeah. some other Bodhisattva. Okay. Okay. So there's something carried forward. Okay. And I don't want to cling on to all that, but it's my head is you know yeah. crazy. Okay, okay. Let me try to clear this up. Okay, we read in the text, we find, you'll find it in the Machima Nikaya time and again, the Buddha, or at least in a few suttas, the Buddha says on the night of his enlightenment, he acquired well, the knowledge of the recollection of past lives, going back one past life, two, three, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, hundreds, thousands of past lives. Okay, then he teaches non-self, five aggregates, not self. How to bring these together. Again, what we refer to as our self looked at, let's say that there's two points of view, two ways to look at this. One we can call the analytical or philosophical point of view. So when we look at the, our individual identity from this analytical or phenomenological point of view. What we find is just the five aggregates coming together. We don't find any kind of core of our being, something that we call a substantial self. 
something that remains the same continuously through time. However, there is this continuity going on throughout, let's say, throughout this life, even though I don't have any core of my being that I can pull out and say, <laughs> this is the real Bhikkhu Bodhi right there. <laughs> but there's just these five aggregates at this moment, always changing. But still, I could remember playing football as a kid in Brooklyn, going to public school, Fort Hamilton Parkway on 52nd Street, was it? <laughs> I can remember back I think I must have been two years old when my sister was born. <laughs> okay, so I have these memories even in this life. So how is this possible if there's no substantial self there? It's possible because there is a continuity in the stream of consciousness. That there is a flowing of the consciousness from moment to moment, and as the consciousness flows on, things that happen, things that I experience, leave some kind of impression which is preserved in the form of a potential memory. That is, I can call it up in the form of a memory. Many things are forgotten and lost. What has happened to, wait, let me continue. What has happened before two years old, I don't remember. But such things did happen. Okay, so my point is that in this life there is, though there's no single lasting self, there is a continuity of experience. And because of this continuity, memories are possible. Now what is true in this life is that this stream of consciousness, the stream of experience, is occurring based on what we call the same physical body. Even this body is always changing, but it preserves some kind of relative or conventional identity. So it's the body also is unfolding continuously from the moment of conception right up to the present unfolding, once one passes the age of 40, starts to fold up <laughs> Okay, now according to the Buddha's teaching, the stream of consciousness which arises based on this body has come into this body from persons which were existing in earlier lives, persons existing in the past. The stream of consciousness that is now occurring in this form, as what I call my identity, is a continuation of a stream of consciousness which was existing in other life forms earlier. Could have been an American in the 1920s, 1930s, could have been a European, could have been an Indian, Sri Lankan, could have been an animal, could have been a deity, we don't know. But um, the physical, and then that life form would have arisen dependent upon earlier life forms, earlier life forms, earlier life forms. So there is this stream of consciousness running through all of these life forms, ever changing, not remaining the same. It's as she expressed that it's a bundle of tendencies, tendencies of character, interests, aptitudes, inclinations undergoing experiences, always changing, coming into this form. And so when we look at what I am now, with the eye of insight, we see five aggregates. But these five aggregates, at least the mental aggregates, are inheriting the experiences of earlier streams of experience. And then when I pass away, assuming I don't become liberated in this life, then this stream of consciousness is going to move on into another form of existence. Again, there's no permanent identity there, like a self, but the stream of consciousness continues. And the different tendencies, inclinations, aptitudes picked up in this life will be preserved in some form, 
and will condition the aptitudes, dispositions, tendencies of the next being to arise in this continuity. That was actually explained very well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, Take the microphone. And um, that helps me a lot. Okay. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn too. Um, <laughs> I still play basketball. Um, so then it is possible, it's not craziness when um, someone might say they have some recollection of a past life. No, 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 not at all craziness, no. That's something that is explainable under all of this. Yeah, it's quite, uh, quite intelligible. And even people who say that they have past life memories, I mean, sometimes one has to be a little distrustful because sometimes I would think, wish projections get transformed into past life memories. Oh, I was Queen Cleopatra. Oh, I was um, Julius Caesar. <laughs> I was Plato. I was Buddha. <laughs> Never a farm laborer in medieval, a peasant in medieval France or a <laughs> street cleaner in 12th century Delhi. <laughs> so it's tricky business because maybe some of these memories are legitimate and maybe some of them are some other delusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. That's very okay. Okay. One question from the internet. Of all the many fetters, why does the fetter of the long grasping of rules and observances get broken so early at the stage of stream entry? Okay, I think this comes about because, as I said earlier, what's called the wrong grasping of rules and observances is actually the view that it is by means of these rules and observances that one can gain liberation. This was a view popular in the Indian circles in the Buddha's time, and it determined, or at least it was the principle that governed the behavior of many of these ascetic communities, where they would, they would under, afflict torments upon themselves and undertake these extreme practices like fasting for weeks on end, sleeping on beds of thorns, bathing in the ice-cold water at the break of dawn, with the idea that by tormenting themselves they would build up a kind of spiritual power that would enable them to break out from the realm of delusion. And the Buddha tried all of these practices and found that they were not successful they were not effective, and so he rejected these types of practices. Okay, so this is a view that by these extreme observances one can gain liberation. And so the stream mentora has practiced the Noble Eightfold Path and gained the first stage of enlightenment through the Noble Eightfold Path. And so he now knows that the way to liberation is essentially through wisdom built upon a foundation of purified moral practice and samadhi or concentration. So he knows that sila or virtue, virtuous behavior, concentration and wisdom form the way to liberation. So now he no longer can adopt the view that it is through these extreme observances that one can gain liberation. It's very basic. I'm, I'm not familiar with the five aggregates, particularly volition. Is that yeah. ego? Could you say? No, the volition is, we call this volitional activities, the activities of will, what lies behind the acts, whatever actions we do. 
the, the mental force. We're go, as we go through, it, we'll come to the five aggregates. So just stick with us and <laughs> we'll come to them. That in talking about, um, but you mentioned Atman as a idea of self, yeah. and, and the way you described it, it almost sounded like it was an individual self. And yet, my understanding of Atman is that there's one Atman, yeah, yeah, not like individual. And yeah, it seems that in the Indian thought in this period, there were different views of self. Some took the self to be a plurality for each individual to have their own individual self. The view that dominates in the Upanishads is the view of that there's one universal self which is reflected in each individual self or each individual person. So there are actually a, a whole variety of views of the self in the Buddha's time. Okay, Nina has a question. Take Pusantu Vibhuti 